Next up, I am going to introduce our next speaker, um, Rachel Radic. Um, Rachel is a Canadian nurse of Indigenous and settler heritage. Uh, indigenous ancestry, ancestry is linked to the Chippewa Nation of Georgina Island in Ontario, Canada. Um, Rachel was inspired to pursue nursing in her mother's footstep and, become a practice, and became a practice nurse in 2018. She completed her Bachelor of Science in Nursing and graduated as a valedictorian in 2021. She also completed her communications degree in the fall of 2020. As a student, she also created an Indigenous Nurses and Allied Interest Group with the Registered Nurses Association of Ontario, and she received the President's Award of Excellency in Leadership. I welcome Rachel um, to her presentation. Chimi Gwach for having me here today. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. All right. Okay, um, can you see my, the, the cover screen? Yeah. Yes, we yes. can, yeah. yeah. There's no speaker's notes. I don't know why, I have two monitors and now they're doing something weird. So, <laughs> as long no as- No speaker's good. notes. Okay, yeah. great. <laughs> so, Ani Bojo, Wabano Kwe Adishnakaz, Anishinaabe Kwe Dao. Georgina Island in Dojaba, Kitchener, Indaya. So hello everyone, my name is Rachel Raddick and uh, my pronouns are she, her, and Kwe. Uh, as it was said before, I am a mixed Anishinaabe woman from Georgina Island, having a settler heritage of Irish, Scottish, and Ukrainian ancestry. Um, I currently live in Kitchener, which is situated on the Haldman Tract and is the traditional lands of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and neutral peoples. So today I'm going to be talking about um, a topic when we think about caregiving and uh, Indigenous women accessing health care. I'm briefly going to be talking on the impacts of colonialism, uh, colonialism on Indigenous women and uh, then briefly discussing uh, forced and coerced sterilization. So within Indigenous communities, uh, the power uh, that women hold and carry um, being the life givers and the water carriers is sacred. Uh, prior to colonization, Indigenous women played key roles within their communities as equals, uh, contributing to communities um, where their gifts called to. But after colonization, communities shifted from a matriarchal society to a patriarchal system that was introduced in 1876 and still exists today within communities. Um, this made Indigenous women unable to be involved in politics or many other parts uh, of community that they used to share their gifts uh, due to gender roles. Uh, particularly First Nation women um, were stripped of their status uh, with the Indian Act uh, if they married a non-Indigenous man. Uh, some of these families, uh, generations later, even now, are still fighting with the government to have enough proof to be able to gain their status back, meaning that even though they have Indigenous heritage and ancestry, the government is denying them their rights to access their status. This controls directly who is eligible for status and directly controls the amount of the population that in the eyes of government is considered indigenous enough to the federal government to meet their treaty obligations in the financial um, and uh, community obligations that come along with that. But it also directly impacts indigenous families in knowing if they're indigenous enough. 
So when we talk about forced and coarse sterilization, and there have been a lot of articles that have been coming out lately, uh, there is a uh, current lawsuit that is going on right now. So uh, with forced and coarse sterilization, it's a form of permanent contraception, which means after the procedure, a woman can no longer have children. These procedures were done sometimes without free prior and informed consent, meaning that Indigenous women were not told about the repercussions of the procedure, or they knew about the procedure, said that they did not want it, and it was still performed on them. This meant that they were cut off from being able to reproduce and directly violated their reproductive rights. So forced and coarse sterilization continues the history of colonization by aiming directly to control and eliminate the population by targeting and the Indigenous woman. So forced and coarse sterilization reduces the number of individuals who can claim Indigenous identity, their rights to land, and the rights to their treaties that are tied to that land. So from 2005 to 2019, there have been over 100 Indigenous women from across Canada who've come forward about either being forced or coerced to undergo a sterilization procedure. When we talk about Indigenous women, and I said before, we are the water carriers, but we are also the seed carriers. So we carry those seeds of life to reproduce. So taking that ability away from being able to reproduce cuts off the ability uh, and is a complete violation of our reproductive rights. So forced and coerced sterilization also undermines the autonomy of an Indigenous woman has over their body. And women who are victims of forced and coerced sterilization are impacted in many ways, mentally, physically, and spiritually. And a few of those are exam in example are pain, hormor hormonal imbalances, loss of identity, depression and anxiety. And to touch on that loss of identity, you know, being that life giver, not be having that taken away from you without your consent, I can't even imagine the how that would feel. So force and course sterilization is one of the ways that healthcare continues to be an unsafe space for Indigenous women, leading to hesitancy across healthcare, which leads to poorer health outcomes for Indigenous women. So when we think about what our role is or how individuals or allies can take action, respecting the matriarchal teachings that Indigenous folks may hold is really important. Learning the history of colonization and thinking about how you can amplify the voices of Indigenous women, girls, and gender diverse people. You can use your voice to speak up about violence and injustice that impacts Indigenous people when accessing healthcare. And reflect how you can make spaces that you work in more culturally aware for Indigenous people is this work doesn't always have to be in the hands of an Indigenous person. We need to walk together with Indigenous women, girls, and gender diverse people to empower them. We need to use resources and toolkits that are Indigenous led. A really good one is the Know Your Rights Toolkit from the Native Women's Association of Canada. I also have a few books that if individuals are interested, um, that talk about the history of Indian hospitals. So um, there are separate beds. Um, I found this one on Amazon. It's by Maureen Lux. Uh, it's really good. And, uh, you know, it really is comprehensive about the, the history of what happened in Indian hospitals within Canada. And then also um, this doesn't, um, this focuses more on Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls, but The Highway of Tears is a really good book that I'd recommend for individuals to read if you want to further uh, your learning on this topic. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. And I just want to say chimiguetch 
to everybody for listening and for having me be a speaker here today. So, miigwech. Thank you, Rachel. That was a really powerful talk. And um, I really appreciate that you gave us action items at the end, um, some that are a little bit, you know, like bigger and um, some that are very actionable. And I love that you gave us a reading list too, because I'm a, I'm a big reader. So thank you. I've got those written down and I'm going to check them out. Hi, everyone. I